Deb, welcome to the Your Digital Marketing Coach podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about, uh, well, I mean, you know, branding is sexy and you've written a lot of provocative books uh, about branding, uh, looking at it from a very unique perspective that I'm excited to dive in today. Obviously, I know we're going to be talking a lot about your latest book, uh, Personality, Cultivate Your Human Authority to Ignite Irrational Brand Loyalty. Deb, uh, we talked beforehand, branding is often seen as this esoteric uh, exercise that you uh, you have a very, very different perspective on. And I guess I want to start with how did this all start? Where did your career begin in branding? Well, I've been doing some kind of marketing or branding, if you will, for basically my entire adult life. And um, where my love and interest and obsession for branding came from is really from my unbranded upbringing. So just quick story how I got into this. Like I grew up in a really interesting household with um, kind of frugal Eastern European parents who never let us have brand name anything. Therefore, because it was taboo, I developed developed an obsession with all things branded, you know, to the point that I'd never even had a McDonald's hamburger until the day that I got my driver's license and I could drive myself to McDonald's. Wow. Um, and so ever since then, you know, the allure and sort of the mystique behind brands and how um, having a strong brand and a strong emotional connection could lead uh, companies and organizations to create products that were really at parity with other products in similar categories, yet charge high higher prices for them, earn higher margins, sell more of them, engender more loyalty. So I've been obsessed with it for, you know, kind of like forever. I always tell people that I'm born to brand, or at least this is the information that I'm compelled to share with the world. So 30 plus years of a career in some form of marketing started out in the technology business. So um, many, many years ago, like my first job, I worked at AT AT&T Bell Labs, which there's nothing less sexy and unbrandy than that. And then, you know, working uh, actually for a couple of, at the time, technology startups in the original days of the internet, uh, and then moving to the agency side of the business, sort of mid-career, and then starting my own company about 20 years ago. So uh, I've been doing this, you know, with all kinds of brands for a really, really long time. And uh, even though I am the person who wrote a book with the title, Branding is Sex, I like really, really unsexy brands and unsexy categories. That's my obsession. Nice. I I have a B two B background as as well, and I believe I believe B two B can really be exciting and sexy. So, one hundred percent appreciate the perspective. What uh, prompted you to launch your own business twenty years ago? <laughs> okay, like this is probably similar to other people's entrepreneurial stories. There was no traditional job that could contain me. Um, maybe because I had problems with authority, unless of course it was me. No, that's not the real truth. There, um, you know, some life changes where I was feeling a little bit out of control, being someone else's employee, um, put me into the headspace of trying to figure out how could I like parentheses crazily get more control over my life and have better work life integration. And, um, so I started my own company, question mark. Uh, but that's really how it happened. I was kind of an accidental entrepreneur. But I was uh, in in the jobs that I had prior to that. I felt really strongly about doing really good work for really great clients. And I wanted to decide what that was. Um, and oddly, I felt I, I felt more in control of my environment and my livelihood and my career and my time and my boundaries and things like that if I was the person who was sort of defining that. And it turned into a really great, successful business. And, you know, I'm happy to be still involved with it today. Yeah, it's funny. When I left corporate, they looked at me like I was insane. But I think you'd agree. We look at people that work at corporate as sort of being insane of not having control of that work-life balance. And so it's an interesting world we live in for sure. Oh, it definitely is. And I think people got a real taste for that during the pandemic, especially corporate people who who were starting to, you know, maybe in a forced manner, live the kind of lifestyle that we live. I told you before we started this interview that I'm in my home near Salt Lake City, Utah. The whole reason that I'm here during ski season is so that I can ski basically every day of the ski season. So I work a little, I ski a little, I work a little more, I hang with friends and family and all of that kind of stuff. I truly have like a very rich life that I don't know that that opportunity would have been afforded me, you know, staying in the agency business or, you know, still continuing to be on the corporate side. 
Yeah, very cool. And I want to let people know this is not, you don't just like quit a job and this happens overnight, obviously. Oh God, no. <laughs> yeah. Heck of a lot of work, uh, blood, sweat and tears that went into it. So, you know, before we get to the book, I want to ask you, so you launched, and I think the entrepreneurial journey is something that a lot of the listeners are interested in because we, a lot of us are entrepreneurs. So I'm just curious when you began this company about branding, uh, we have a lot of listeners that might start a company about, you know, they manage SEO or social media. I guess, how do you, you know, what services do you offer to manage branding would be my my question. Or or did you offer different services when you began? When I started, I actually, I had come out of a strategic communications firm for the technology industry, which covered things like executive communication, thought leadership, um, and public relations for tech companies. And I was running a practice within that business that was really focused on early stage companies and kind of in the business strategy and communications realm. And also we did kind of early stage PR. And when I originally hung my shingle, what I was doing was like, I, you know, I, I caught a couple of, of clients that were coming out of that business and, you know, they hired me to do PR kind of stuff. But then, uh, you know, since I, before that I worked, I, I actually have a research background, like a quantitative research background, specifically in the branding world. And I took like this idea of like storytelling and research and methodologies and quantitative and qualitative and all that and brought it together. And I got an assignment with a company to train product managers to become brand managers. So this was a company that was going through a transformation from a very product centric company to more of like a brand and customer focused company. And I, I, I was given this like weird, bizarre assignment, like take these people and turn them into these kind of people. And through that, like developed this branding methodology, I had to take what is this weird. And I said it before, like kind of esoteric and squishy qualitative thing, which is the emotional connection that people people have with organizations and the people and the, and the products behind them and things like that, and turn that into something that was very, very tactical that then former product managers could execute as brand managers. And Mm -hmm. so that's how like sort of the branding practice was born. So I didn't exactly set out to start a brand strategy consultancy. I started out really as a lot of entrepreneurs in the marketing world do as an independent consultant, there was a lot of demand for what I was doing. And um, all of a sudden I got a bunch of clients and I needed help. So I started hiring helpers and then lo and behold, I was a company. So that's kind of, that's kind of, I, I was an accidental entrepreneur, we'll say, because I would have been very happy just doing consulting, you know, maybe for the rest of my life. So I just out of curiosity, that brand, well, the company that wanted you to train their product managers to become brand managers, was that a B2B brand? It wasn't. It's a really interesting thing. It was in the consumer world, um, but they sold through uh, They sold through a channel. So there was a B2B aspect to it. Actually, it was a huge company that, that makes commemorative products and like the centerpiece of it was Class Rings. Okay, like high school it. and college class rings, but they also made Super Bowl rings and um, the Bowling 300 ring and all kinds of stuff like that. So I, I cut my teeth on an interesting, like a really interesting consumer brand because of the way that they sold. They they had a retail channel, plus they had these like resale channels. And then they, they had independent reps who went into high schools and sold class rings, like standing at a table, you know, in the cafeteria during lunch hour and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I came out of technology into CPG and then went very, very quickly back into technology because it was really something that I had a passion for. Got it. Very cool. Yeah. I uh, I don't know of many B2B companies. Well, back in the day when I worked that it, there were no brand managers. In fact, I worked in Japan where they don't even have product managers. Whole mm-hmm. other story. Um, but, but very cool experience. So from this experience, right? Uh, I do not talk much about brand name, but I'll say, you know, if you're at the drugstore and you are selling CVS or you're selling Tylenol, you want to become the Tylenol that people pay more for, that they have this emotional attachment to. So I don't know if that's this type of irrational brand loyalty that you speak of, but I know that that's the main topic of your newest book, Personality. So Mm -hmm. let's dive into the topic. What is irrational brand loyalty? Oh, I am so excited that you asked that because having an understanding of irrational loyalty is something that helps you understand me, my books, my practice, all that kind of stuff. So here's how I define irrational loyalty. Irrational loyalty is that feeling or it's that condition where people are so indelibly bonded to a brand that they'd feel like they were cheating on it 
if they were to choose an alternative. An example that I always give is I'm irrationally loyal to iThingies. Quick story because this illustrates it just perfectly. So I've owned probably every one of these ever made, right? And if you look at my desk, it's like covered in iThingies. Well, a couple of years ago, Samsung came out with a competing product to that. And I thought, you know what? That thing cost $400, $500 less than the latest iPhone. So I'm going to go check it out. So I went down to my local Best Buy. I met a wonderful, adorable, very well-educated sales associate who told me everything about that Samsung Galaxy S whatever. Here are some things I learned. I learned that it had faster memory. It had more durable glass. It cost $500 less. It had this big, wide open ecosystem and no apps that were like native apps on the phone. I could like pick and choose from all of those different things. Yet, when I held that beautiful lickable technology in my hand, I felt dirty. Like I felt like I was cheating on Apple. And at the end of the day, I bought another iPhone. And so there is nothing rational about that. And irrational loyalty is that condition where people are so bonded to a brand, they'd feel like they were cheating. It's the reason why when you go into CVS and you're like, here's the CVS brand acetaminophen and here is Tylenol. And you're like, mm, which one of these do I trust more? Which one actually killed people and came back from it, right? We still like Tylenol is still the number one seller brand. And so I've been fascinated by that condition, what creates irrational loyalty, how do uh, brands in every category, like what is the origin of that irrational loyalty? And the one thing that we narrow it down to, at least based on some quantitative research that we just launched at the end of last year, the one thing we learned is that the strongest contributor to irrational loyalty is indispensability. When a product becomes indispensable to someone and products and brands don't necessarily become indispensable to people just because of their functional benefits. It's it's all of the other stuff that's above and beyond those functional benefits that create that brand loyalty and allow companies to charge more for their products and services. They scale more rapidly, uh, more profitably, more focused. They have bigger footprints. In our study, we measured brands, 50 of the world's most valuable global brands in, I think, dif uh, 10 different categories. What we learned was the brands that have more irrational loyalty have a bigger footprint and they earn on average 40% more revenue than, than like unbranded or lower ranked brands in irrational loyalty. I hope that helps. Yes, that's, that's amazing. Thank you. Curious. I'm assuming because your B2B background that this is also applicable to B2B brands. I'm curious if it is, which I assume it is, how mm -hmm. might it be different? Is is functionality a little bit more important with B2B or it's still the same? It's still the same. It's still the same. When you look at the characteristics of the of the best brands in the world, like truly legendary brands, they all behave the same way and they all have similar attributes. Branding and irrational loyalty and getting above and beyond those basic functional benefits and what I also refer to as proximal emotional benefits contributes as much to the growth and scale of of B2B organizations as it does for consumer organizations. In fact, I would say branding is even more important in the B2B world because of this notion, you have very, very complex sales in the B2B world, right? You have like, I don't know, five or six different purchasing roles. The person who identifies the need, the person who selects alternatives and presents, the person who recommends a particular brand, a person who sort of tests it, a person who approves the purchase. And then the sixth one would be the person who actually uses the brand. In very, very complex scenarios like that, you really, really need a brand to stand out. And if you look at the, the rankings of the most valuable global brands in the world, there are as many B2B brands on that list as there are consumer brands, brands like SAP, Salesforce, um, some of the clients that I have worked with, like Microsoft and Dell and whatever. These are among the most valuable global brands in the world. When people can't differentiate between options and, and all things are equal and you know, a, a, a rack system is the same as a rack system is the same as a rack system with regard to, you know, bits and bytes and speeds and feeds and how many hops to a tier one network. You need brand to help people make a decision and make them feel a particular way. And when we talk about hacking Maslow's hierarchy for fun and profit and the branding methodology and some of those actionable tactics, um, I can share with, you know, with people at B2B companies as well as consumer companies, how they can use brand to their advantage.
Yeah, well, I definitely want to get to that. You know, how do we hack that in a tactical advice? But one more question. You mentioned, obviously, you know, big brands. Can small businesses leverage the same tactics? A hundred percent. So I always tell people, and I wrote about this extensively in Branding as Sex, that branding is an always on activity and brand early, often and always. And, and branding really is about identifying, nailing, and being able to articulate the core DNA of your brand in a way that's meaningful to your most important, most highly predictive of your success customer. Even for small companies, you don't want to be a commodity. I tell people this all the time. So I run a I run a strategy and marketing firm for B2B technology and professional services businesses. That business operates out of Austin, Texas. You cannot swing a cat over your head and not hit 150 other people who say they do exactly what we do. However, my closest competitor, so the company that we're always neck and neck for like uh, biggest women-owned business in Austin or like biggest marketing and advertising agency in the rankings, we're always neck and neck. We never compete for clients because we have vastly different brands. And the reason that people hire us isn't only for those marketing services, which frankly, like, you know, I, I don't believe that I offer something above and beyond what anybody else does in terms of capabilities or functional benefits, but how we elevate our customers and how we help them achieve their goals is vastly different from anyone else. And so brand is really important for smaller businesses. We're a small business. I mean, I only have eight employees at this point and, uh, you know, been chugging along at this for 20 years, but we have a very, very distinctive brand and a very unique point of view and an authority put footprint that belongs to only us. So I think it's even more important for small businesses to really, really clarify their brand and understand who they are, who they are for, and how they elevate those people in their experience. Wow, that, that was amazing. Brand early, brand often, always, brand often. Yeah, always. That, yep. that's the quotable tweet from today's interview so far, but I know there's more to come. So you had hinted at this of hacking Maslow's hierarchy to get to the one thing that attracts and retains le le legions of fans. It's funny, um, once a year, uh, I'll go to a marketing conference and someone will talk about Hazel's hierarchy, uh, Maslow's hierarchy, and everyone in the room will be sort of like blown away. But it's this constant thing that we in marketing are always talking about. I'm sure that most of our listeners are familiar with it, but why don't we start with what it is and then how do you hack that? Yeah, totally. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I always say that Maslow was a marketer and Maslow's hierarchy applies in two ways when we're talking about branding. So real quickly, just a review of Maslow, like going back to psych 101 in undergrad, or, you know, even if you had a high, a high school psychology class, Maslow's hierarchy, it's this pyramid construct, like psychology, consumer behavior, economics, social studies, like we, we love our pyramids because the pyramid construct suggests that you have to satisfy things at the base before you can get to the next level before you can get to the next level, next level. Maslow's hierarchy basically says at the bottom of the pyramid, the baseline requirements to sustain life are food, water, shelter, air, the ability to procreate. At the next level, once you've satisfied those things, then people can start to feel safety, right? So safety is in the next tier. In the next tier, which is a little bit smaller, are our belongingness or affiliation. So basically Maslow's hierarchy suggests that unless you satisfy like the basic needs, the basic human needs that people have, make them feel safe and secure. So they feel like, you know, when they go to bed at night, they're not going to get eaten by a bear. Um, until you satisfy those things, they can't feel like they belong to a group and feel love. And then once they feel like they belong to a group and they feel love, that raises their self-esteem. And eventually they get to the top of Maslow's hierarchy, which is self-actualization. And Maslow defines self-actualization as this like sort of personal nirvana point where people are vibrating on a higher plane. They're free of judgment. They're their highest performing best selves. As Americans or North Americans, and this is something just a side note, when I when I speak to audiences outside the United States, you know, I always ask people, I'm like, how many of you are fully self-actualized individuals? Outside the US, I get, you know, dozens of hands raised. In the United States, we all sit on our hands. Not really sure what that means, but we all have these moments where we feel fully self-actualized, right? And so for me, it's like I'm a professional speaker and a writer and I do media and I run a company and all that kind of stuff. But for me, when I feel fully self-actualized, I am in my zone of genius. I have all eyes looking at me. I'm like getting breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough. So you know that feeling, right? So 
understanding Maslow's hierarchy and like it's it is truly this hierarchy you have to achieve this before you get to this level before you get to this level this level you have to believe that what people buy what they eat what they drink what they wear the software they buy for their businesses the computers they buy for their employees are all part of their ascension up Maslow's hierarchy like what people are buying and what brands they buy is part of what elevates them to this place of self-actualization. Right. So are you with me, Neil? Do you buy into that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's really fascinating. Um, it's a different, obviously, the Maslow's hierarchy is what it is, and people interpret it differently. And most recently, I hear a lot of people interpret it, people want community. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, you know, this is why a lot of brands and 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 what have you are, are trying to, you know, build community and community marketing is becoming big. I've never heard of it expressed this way. Um, from a branding perspective, but I get it. So keep going. I'm, I'm really curious as to where you're going to go. All right, great. So at the beginning, I highlighted for you that Maslow's hierarchy, like it applies in two different ways. One is like, if you buy into the fact that what people buy, what they eat, what they drink, what they wear, what they drive, otherwise like very, very expensive sports cars wouldn't exist, right? Because it's sure. all part of people's path to self-actualization. Maslow's hierarchy applies in this way as well, because every brand has its own sort of Maslow's hierarchy. Right. And so, um, Neil, do you have a car? Uh-huh. Uh, when did you purchase that car? Uh, I lease cars every three years. So this okay. one was just like six months ago. Okay. All right. What kind of car do you have? It's a Volvo. It's a Volvo. Okay. All right. So we My can first Volvo, by the way. I've never, never owned a Volvo. Never thought I would own a Volvo. So. All right. So do, does your Volvo, does it have wheels? Yes. Does it have a steering wheel? Yes. Does it have a chassis? Yes. They have some mode of perambulation, like a combustion, internal combustion engine or your know, motors in the wheels. So you have a way to get from point A to point B. Let me ask you, does it have a, a power door locks, power windows, power steering? Yes. Does your car have Bluetooth? Yes. Okay. These are what we refer to as baseline requirements. Baseline requirements, the ante to get into the game, the things that a, a brand, a product, a company needs to have in order to be considered a that in the category. Those things, we call them functional benefits in Maslow's hierarchy for brands, which is called the brand values pyramid. They are sort of equal to those basic physiological needs and safety needs that people have, right? Gotcha. Okay. And so every brand has to satisfy those needs. Now, when you went to buy that Volvo, you probably considered a bunch of other brands. You looked at other things or a bunch of brands in the consideration set. Maybe you test drove some things and stuff like that. Did any one of those brands advertise to you on the basis of our car has wheels? No. Right. Yet, and this is especially true in technology markets, yet we have companies and brands out there advertising basically on the basis of our car has wheels, bits, bytes, speeds, speeds, how many hops to a tier one network, right? It would be the equivalent of selling ice cream on the basis of it's cold and it's sweet, right? Baseline requirements. Every brand has a bunch of baseline requirements that they have to satisfy. Those baseline requirements, interesting thing, they change. They change over time. So for instance, I know you can't believe this. I'm old enough that the very first car that I purchased, I had to pay extra for power door locks and power windows. I paid $400 for vanity mirror, which is that mirror on the back of the visor, right? Now, today in 2023, if you're going out to buy a brand new Volvo, the 2023 model that you bought in 2022, I'm guessing, or you leased in 2022, you wouldn't even think of getting that if it didn't have Bluetooth. You have like Apple CarPlay or Android Play or something like that in there as well? Yeah, that was one of the things I made sure that the car had. Okay, so this is really, really important, especially for B2B people. In the middle of Maslow's hierarchy for brands, the brand values pyramid, are what we call emotional benefits, <laughs> excuse me, which are like features and options, bells and whistles, lipstick on a pig, the stuff that sort of sweetens the pot. These things in and of themselves are not imitatable because, and if you want to tweet something else from today's episode, it's this, because today's options packages become tomorrow's standard equipment. Brands cannot differentiate themselves on the basis of power door locks, power windows, power steering, because when you put it out there to the world and it becomes an expectation, then everyone else in the industry is going to adopt that into their products, right? That's why we have innovation. At the top of Maslow's hierarchy, fully self-actualized brands are the ones that make people feel like they are part of a group. You mentioned communities here. 
part of a group of like-minded people, sort of birds of a feather flock together kind of thing. And that elevates their self-esteem and makes them feel a particular way. The top of the brand values pyramid, the thing that is like self-actualization are the values and beliefs of both the brand and the people who use it. So I know something about you, Neil. This is the first time we've ever met the fact that you lost least of all the last year. I know about you that you like nice things. You're not flashy. You probably value safety. Hmm. You have, um, you, you probably have a very practical down to earth, very pragmatic side, yet you are discerning and feel like you are deserving of something that offers precision Swedish engineering, right? That's at least what I know about you through your use of the Volvo brand. So the brands that we use, what we eat, what we drink, what we drive, what we wear, the software we buy for our companies, all of those things, they say something about us, not just to the rest of the world, but to us as individuals. And the best brands in the world, they get to the top of that pyramid and they have a set of values and beliefs. And I'll say like, this is just a side note and this is really important. It's demographically appropriate now and it's actually an imperative. As younger purchase influencers come of age, they are demanding to see the gooey insides of brands in every category. They need to know what do brands stand for? What processes do they use? Um, how do they actually procure the material Materials that they make their products from? Do they treat their employees well? Are they investing in responsible and sustainable ways in our environment and our world and all those kind of things? People need to know what's on the GUI inside of brands. And the best brands in the world become part of the identity of the people who use them. Does that make sense? Like hacking Maslow's hierarchy for that? It does. So, I, I mean, is it tied to innovation or I guess like how did now Volvo? for like the last, you know, ever since I was young, it was always about safety, like in the television yeah, yeah. advertising, right? So, so yep. I get that. Um, some other things that you talked about, they have never directly, maybe indirectly in their promotions, they've talked about it, but I guess how, you know, how do they hack it? And maybe it gets down to, you were, we were talking earlier, this four point formula for creating, you know, the strategy for your brand. And maybe that, that is how you go about hacking it. Yeah. But I'd really how do like you to get, get to the it. top of the pyramid? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So I encourage everybody to like build the brand values pyramid for their brand, the stuff at the bottom, those baseline requirements, these are the baseline requirements for your category, right? So in order to be called like a mid-sized luxury sedan, which I would, are you driving a sedan or are you driving an SUV? Like what do you have? Uh, I have the XC90. So it's a, so it's a, a, it's a, it's a mid-sized SUV, right? Mid yeah, size, I, would, I would, I would call it like a mid-size, uh, mid-size luxury SUV. I drive an Audi Q5 and I also have a Mercedes uh, GLB 250. So all of them are sort of in the same. My category. wife drives a GLB 250, too funny. Okay. So like they're all in the same category. They have to have yeah. some of the same things. You have to put a check mark next to them or otherwise people will defect, right? Those are the baseline requirements. Right. So for your brand, whoever's listening to this and God, I hope someone's listening for, for your category, like write down, what are all those things? Wing, wheels, steering wheel. Like you probably, have really, really nice headlights. You got a kick-ass stereo. You have leather seats. You've got like 12 point restraint system. You have in order to become, you know, to be considered a luxury, anything, it probably has to have a sunroof or a moonroof or, you know, like my Audi has like a panoramic roof, all that kind of stuff. Those are baseline requirements. Those are not the things that you market on, but make a list of those and then put a check mark next to the things that you do better than other people and where you may be deficient, right? So that you understand from a product perspective, what do I need to build into my product or what are the attributes that maybe I'm going to ignore? In the middle part of the tier pyramid, list like what are some of the bells and whistles? Well, some of the bells and whistles that come with a Volvo are like this extra safety record and the crash test dummies and, uh, you know, like extra safety engineering. And, and maybe it has like a reinforced kit. I don't remember what Volvos have as special stuff, but these are the things that you have. Make a list of what those things are that are your bells and whistles. And then think about how does it make my customer feel, right? So you probably feel safe, confident, secure, um, deserving, like uh, you feel reliable, you feel special, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the emotional benefits. Remember, those things are not in and of themselves like stand out. They don't stand out. They're imitatable because I could say some of the same things about different features that come with my Audi, right? At the top of the pyramid are the things that make your Volvo a Volvo and not a crappy Mazda, right? Or Mazdas aren't crappy. I shouldn't say that. Mazdas are great. They're just not for me. 
right? This is where this is where the whole branding methodology comes in. So I encourage everybody to like build that brand values pyramid. But what I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to tell you now, this is the actionable part of this. This is the stuff that every single person can do by themselves with their team is, is the four things, four things, the best brands in the world. They do four things and you can, you can do these things. Now I'm not saying they're easy, but you can start to, you know, kind of go through this process for yourself to like really clearly define the strategic foundation for your brand. First thing, the best brands in the world all of them, they aim their brand at a singular, ideal, archetypal customer. One customer. They aim their brand at this one person. It doesn't mean that segment marketing is dead. It doesn't mean that personas are dead or anything like that. But the best brands in the world, they aim their brand at that one person, right? Who is the most ideal, who is the most highly predictive of their success. The one who is the most profitable, the one that's going to buy from them again and again and again and advocate for them. That's who they aim their brand at. And that brand, it shows up regardless of the channel that it's purchased in or the segment that it's sold to or what what the product is. So that's the first thing. The exercise is as easy as this. And this is what I do with my clients. We get out a big piece of paper. We freaking draw that person. Mm. If that person is a good listener, we draw them with giant ears. If they have a big heart, they have a big heart in the picture. If they have a lot of money under their control, we show them standing on a pile of money. The ideal customer for my company in her picture, and we have a picture and we bring her to the table when we do our strategic planning. Her name is Lindsay, and she's based on a real human being that we have worked with at five different companies. She is the chief marketing officer of an enterprise software company. And she she's so irrationally loyal to us that she takes us with her everywhere she goes. But in her picture, she has what we call Lindsay's golden shovel. She's got, she literally has a golden shovel in her hand, which is what she uses when she hears that her agency partner has a compelling idea that's going to help her meet her goals. She will use her golden shovel and go dig for budget to pay for it. Right. So be very, very specific about who that singular human being is and have that person be part of all of your conversations about the brand. So it's your goal to become part of that person's identity. Think of that person wearing a Neil t-shirt, right? Who is the ideal person who is going to be consuming your content and using your services and, and draw a picture of that and, and get everybody on the same page. So that's the first thing the best brands in the world do. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for the next ones? I know this is, this is amazing, Deb. Keep going. Okay. The next ones are in the category of what I call the three brand swagger questions. So you've done the first step, which is create this profile of the ideal archetypal customer. And it's not a demographic profile. It's demographic, firmographic, but mostly important, psychographic, attitudinal, behavioral. Because if you understand that person, you understand that person's values and beliefs, you understand why they're going to buy from you. It goes up well above and beyond those functional benefits that we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. So best brands in the world, you have that as a picture, that ideal customer. Next, you're going to do, you're going to answer the three brand swagger questions. Question number one, what does it say about that person that they buy my brand? What does it say about them? That question really helps you understand the story of how your brand becomes part of that person's identity, how it becomes part of who they are, the story that it tells the rest of the world about them, that they purchased your brand. What does it say about me that I use Salesforce versus Zoho, right? What does it say about me that I use HubSpot versus Salesforce, right? That it's really trying to pick up on what makes my brand indispensable to that ideal customer. So the first question is, what does it say about that customer that they use your brand? Not that they use a mobile phone, but what does it say about them that they use an iPhone, mm -hmm. right? Second question to answer. It's the hardest question to answer. It's where I earn all my money. And you got a question? Yeah, no, no. And that is almost like when you were analyzing why I chose a Volvo, those were some of the things that the people at Volvo should have been thinking about, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I know that the people at Volvo are thinking about that all the time, <laughs> right? Yeah, they totally. Volvo is a very strong brand. It's one of the top 100 most valuable global brands. And perennially it is there because there's like fierce loyalty there. And I've owned two Volvos in my life. I just have, I have moved into a different phase of my life, which is I don't have babies and baby seats anymore. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, they're boxy, but they're good. 
Right. So back to, back to the, you know, the formula, the four things that you need to do. You've identified your ideal customer. You've answered the question of what does it say about them that they buy my brand? The next question, this is the most important question to ask. It is the most difficult to answer. And this is one, if you don't know the answer to this, go out and ask your customers. But that question is, what is the one thing that people get from my brand that they can't get anywhere else. What is the one thing? This is about singularity because the best brands in the world, they aim their brand at a singular ideal customer. They become part of that person's identity. They are unique. They're singular. They're not just different. The best brands in the world are singular. There is nothing else like them. Google, Amazon are examples of singular brands, right? Meaning they stand alone. They are truly unique. So I gave you the story before about marketing agencies in Austin and you can't swing a cat over your head, not hit 150 other people who who say that they do exactly what I do. The way that we answer this question is the one thing that you get from us that you can't get from anyone else is you get a kick in the ass. Like we're the marketing firm that you hire when you have audacious goals you have short runway to get there and you want to be pushed not just to do the best you can, but do whatever it takes to 10X your business or whatever those audacious goals are. You need a kick in the ass to get that done. So the one thing that you get from us, you can get marketing services from us. You can get the same marketing services from the people across the street, but they come to us for the kick in the ass, right? So what's the one thing that customers get from your brand that they don't get from anyone else. So that's about singularity and uniqueness. And the third question, which this is like the Maslow's hierarchy question. It's a really simple question. How does your brand make your customer the hero in his or her own story? So challenge to everybody who's listening to it or reading your notes or whatever, go on your computer or on your mobile phone, open up your company's webpage. If the first word on the page is the company name or the word we, you're doing it wrong because your brand should be about them, not about you. People need to feel heroic. They get to stand on top of the mountain. They get to get to their Maslow's hierarchy. They get the guy, they get the girl, they get the prize, they get the trophy. They get Nirvana through use of your brand. Specifically, How do you help them get to their nirvana, right? So if you put this all together, best brands in the world, they have four characteristics. They aim their brand at a singular ideal archetypal customer. They become part of that person's identity by answering the question, what does it say about Neil that he drives a Volvo? Mm -hmm. They are unique. They're singular. So what's the one thing that they get from your brand they can't get from anyone else? So from Neil's from from Neil's purchase of a Volvo, like the one thing he gets from Volvo, he doesn't get from anyone else, is that undeniable, like maniacal obsession with safety, right? Or at least the Volvo feeling of. One thing, right? Yeah. And then finally, how does that make you a hero in your own story? Well, it probably makes you feel confident, secure, safe, and like you can go anywhere, right? And that you're, you know, you're going to do it safely ensconced in the love of a Volvo. So that right there, you guys, That is, that is the formula for building a brand. If you do nothing else in branding, if you do absolutely nothing else, just do those four things. Ideal customer profile and answer the three brand swagger questions. And you have at least the strategic foundation for your brand that's inclusive of your best customer versus here's a story about speeds and feeds and bits and bytes. And I suppose, so that, that last point, uh, I was wondering if the, the concept of the story brand was going to come out and, you know, that last point definitely came out. Um, and I, I suppose that everyone listening is like, okay, I get it. They're like nodding. It's like, okay, what do I do next? And uh, I know I have a client that I've actually worked with a official uh, certified story brand consultant. Um, so I know the process of, hey, you know, how do we make the customer hear the story? Well, what is our messaging? What is our website? It really gets included in everything. I'm assuming that everything you're talking about as well just gets included in everything that brand does, the messaging, the product. Yeah, so so a brand is an experience. And and I think that this is really important. Like that brand is is a relationship. So this idea of a rational loyalty, I think it's important to understand like the origin of this. Um, Neil, are, are, you, are you married? Do you have a significant other? I'm married, yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. The relationship that you have with your significant other, your, your, your spouse 
every time you guys behave on brand for your relationship, you make deposits into an emotional bank account that you share, right? Mm. Hopefully, uh, are you married? Are you married to a woman? Yes. Okay. All right. So, so your wife conceivably, you and your wife, like, uh, when you do things like you do something nice for her, you fix something without being asked, or, you know, you, you walk by an overflowing trash can and you're like, Oh, you know what? Maybe I should take that out. And you do that without being prompted. Uh, you bring her flowers, you cook her dinner, you, you know, you, you pick up the kids from school, whatever, whatever those things are, you're making deposits into this emotional bank account that you both share when you both deposit into this shared emotional bank account, it goes well in the positive. And that is the thing that prevents her from divorcing you when you do a shitty job of loading the dishwasher. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. This irrational loyalty relationship exists between brands and their customers. Right. And this relationship is enhanced through every touch point of the brand. And that's going to be, like you said, it's going to be in like all of your written deliverables. It's going to be in your marketing materials. It's going to be in your advertisements, but it's also going to be in the way that say you, you educate employees to serve customers. It's going to be in, in the way that the media and analysts cover you. It is brand is delivered in 360 degrees. And, and if you look at brand as a relationship all of those marketing things are like the tip of the iceberg. That's the part of the brand that people see. What's most important is all the stuff that's below the surface, which is, you know, mission, vision, values, like your standards of conduct, the relationships that employees have with each other and with customers, how you look outside in the world, but more importantly, how you look inside, like how you deliver on your values and beliefs. So um, that's why I say branding is an always on activity. And it's, you know, early often and always like for brands to remain relevant, they have to be relevant in 360 degrees like that. So you're exactly right. And it's more. And I, I assume that it's not just the VP of marketing. It really has to become part of the DNA. I'm assuming like every Apple employee, every Tesla employee that this sort of branding almost becomes like a religion. Um, yeah. I mean, it's like so a religion or a cult or something like that. I mean, for instance, like we have a set of core values for my, for my company that like every single employee doesn't just know what they are. They can say them, they can explain them and they can recognize those behaviors and other people that serve as like a set of guidelines or like guardrails for behavior, for how we deliver on the promise of our brand. And so the best brands in the world, the people understand the brand, they know what the brand stands for. They're proud to wear the logo of the brand on a shirt when they walk around out there in public and things like that. And so um, branding is, is as much internal as it is external. And so it really is about defining that sort of core DNA. The formula that I gave you, the one, two, three, four thing is part of defining the core DNA of the brand. Yeah. And it, it just, I'm just thinking for like the very small business, uh, I'm just correlating something I heard recently, the gentleman named Kevin Roos, who's a New York Times author, he wrote a book about uh, artificial intelligence. And this was a conference about, uh, about AI. And he was talking about what jobs remain even with AI. And he says, I'm going to tell you about my accountant. He goes, I love, like people hate tax season. He goes, I love going to my accountant during tax season. The accountant, well, the head accountant, the CEO of the company is a former comedian, right? Mm. And he only hires people that are either former comedians or actually go to comedy school, you know, after work to learn how to become a comedian. So you have accountants that are all comedians and it's, it's their brand. I mean, it's, it's a very tangible one, uh, very intuitive to understand, but it is one example of how they elevate themselves to be completely different um, and make this very irrational loyalty. They're fun to work with. Yeah, no, that's, I, I mean, in like, that's part of the core DNA of the brand, right? right? I know somebody who has like a huge application and, so- and custom software development company, and he hired only people for whom coding was a second career, and mm. they didn't go to computer science school. And it gave his brand a really, really unique perspective that he hired people who had been in the real, like the real world or who had been in the outside world, who had actually worked with like 
other humans in real life applications and things like that. And it really was like part of the DNA of his brand. And so like, I love the example of the comedian accountant, man, I could sure use one of those. That's for sure. <laughs> but like on this topic of AI, um, it's interesting to note when I, when I wrote personality, which like mostly was conceived during the pandemic, the book that I was working on when the pandemic hit, like the working title was why AI can't solve AI's marketing problem. Like I, I, I continue to be like a little bit uneasy about AI yet. Like the strategists that work for my company are, are taking classes and learning like prompt engineering and things like that to be able to accelerate processes and train AI with brand voice and and point of view and and all of that kind of stuff and whatever. I don't think that AI is ever going to take over marketing jobs uh, entirely. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of lazy uses of chat GPT and the like and things like that. And what we're going to see is like, the, the death of content, but I think we're also going to see the rebirth of content with a very clear branded point of view and a footprint of authority. And I think that that's really, really important. Yeah. Like I'm, it, I, I'm nervous because I'm nervous about what it can do to my business. Cause I've been talking to a lot of other CEOs who are like, oh yeah, I'm right. I'm using chat GPT to write my company newsletter. And I'm like, oh God. Right. <laughs> Because, you know, as the CEO of, of a, you know, scaling organization that sells office furniture, you know, he doesn't have the innate gift that a lot of us, us marketers have, which is for clearly defining a brand through the emotional connection and the relationship that we want to have with customers. And so my prediction is we're going to see like a dumbing down and sort of like a a commoditization of content, which is going to create a need for the strategically minded brand oriented people to like really dial that stuff in. So um, yeah, I mean, I could talk all day about this and I may still write that book about why AI can't solve AI's marketing problem. You know, we'll see. Like I I know I I have another book in me. You're bang on. There were, this uh, talk was in San Francisco. There were talks of, you know, prompt engineers that are making, you know, seven figure salaries, uh, not seven, I'm sorry, high six figure salaries. Um, it's become so hot. And uh, Jasper, uh, Jasper.ai, which was the sponsor of the conference, they uh, announced a new brand voice tool that they're trying to build in. Uh, I, I think we have a long way to go, but I do think that is the future that the, that everyone, every brand will have their own individual AI that if an employee ten, you know, wants to use it, it will create content that is at least, you know, aligned with the brand, but no, it's still, it's still AI content, not human content. Yeah. I mean, yesterday I went to chat GPT and I was like, write and write a thoughtful email to the clients of soul marketing, announcing a price increase and also feature the irrational loyalty index study as a benefit. And what it came out with was this like really robotic response, which never would have been written by me. I mean, if you've read any of my books, like they read exactly like I talk, like I'm a no bullshit kind of person. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I, I said, now rewrite that message in the voice of Deb Gabor. And it came back with something that was almost a little bit sarcastic And then I told it, I said, okay, using that last one, now make it slightly more professional in Deb Gabor's voice as if she's talking to a group of CEOs. And what it came back with, it was uncanny. Like I, 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 I was like, I could have written this. Mm. Right. Um, I mean, I, I guess it, it, there's enough content in the world and on the internet and the books that I've written, the media have done videos, all that kind of stuff that, that the AI can go out there and glean, like, what is the voice of Deb Gabor? But likewise, I could say, do it in the tone of a skateboarder. Mm-hmm. Oh man, our prices are going up. We're going to shred, you, you know, whatever. It's like, it's getting there is, is what I'm saying, but it's going to, it, it really is going to take, it, it's like a garbage in garbage out kind of scenario. And it's going to, it's going to take some thoughtful strategic people. I'm just worried about a mismatch between like, we are marketers and marketing skills and storytelling skills and what prompt engineers are doing. Like we're like, how, how do we, how do we merge those kinds of things together? It'd be interesting to watch. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, two things, two things, two takeaways from what you just talked about there. Number one is that it's all about the prompts. 
And I think people just, they'll like type a question, like a Google search, they don't get the answer. And, and like, okay, I'll try a Google search when it, it's, it's these prompts that get you these really, really good answers. But the number two thing is also based on what's, whatever's out there on the internet. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the chat GPT, well, the, the GPT-3 model at least stopped at like June, 2021. So, yeah, um, yeah. and you were fortunate that you're a best-selling author of three books. You already have tons of content out there, but for people yeah. that don't have content out there, they're not going to be able to write in their own voice. No, you're so. going to have to train it yourself, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and you know, the content that it's pulling from right now, at least the free version of the chat GPT that we're using, you know, just screwing around with it, like that content, like in the last two years, I could have completely gone wackadoodle and like gone off the farm. And and now all of a sudden I don't talk about irrational loyalty and I don't, you know, and I don't have that like direct plain talking point of view or whatever. So um, there are limitations to it. I think we, we, as, as marketers and storytellers and strategists, we need to embrace it and figure out how to use it to like maybe accelerate research and discovery. But, but like, it is not truth. It is, it is not truth. And in branding, what is truth is what is like going to emotionally ignite the ideal customer to vote for us again and again and again with like mind, heart and wallet. Right. Yeah, totally. And I mean, it just goes to show you two things. Number one, that AI really is the center of any marketing conversation these days. I had no idea we'd go there today, but we did. But number two, it really doesn't have a place in everything we talked about up until now, at least not yet. We don't know what the future holds. But Deb, this has been an amazing interview. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you. For those of you out there, Deb, the author, Deb Gabor, author, personality. Obviously, I know that you're the author of three books. They're all available on Amazon or wherever mm -hmm. fine books are sold. Um, how can the listener who wants to get back, how can the Lindsay that is listening to this podcast, who wants a kick in the butt, who wants 10X tomorrow or yesterday, uh, how can they go out and, and find you and connect and engage with you? Well, you can look me up on chat GPT. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, debgabor.com is the best way to get in touch with me. And I will say all of these exercises that I talked about, ideal customer brand values pyramid, um, the three brand questions, also some material about brand archetypes, which we didn't talk about here today, brand personality, et cetera. I give free downloads on my website, like go get these exercises, do them yourself, do them with your team. Also write to me, text me, call me, you know, whatever. Um, it, I, I'll talk to anybody. Just tell me where you came from. I give this stuff away for free. And if you read personality, you'll learn all about this. I give this stuff away for free because I'm compelled to show this information with other people. When, when organizations create this condition of irrational loyalty and, and they create strong brands, it contributes to their ability to contribute to their economies and healthier economies are, are better for human beings. And, and um, I give things away with, out asking for anything in return. I don't want anything from you. I'm just giving this to you because uh, I'm on a mission. I'm a, I'm personally on a million brand mission to ignite irrational loyalty in brands all over the world. So like, go get those things for free. I give them away. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Once that that's Deb Gabor, D E B G A B O R. Um, it sort of is spelled like it sounds, but just to make sure. Well, Deb, thank you so much. Uh, really enjoyed uh, you know, interviewing you. I'm sure there's a lot of Lindsay's out there that'll reach out to you and what an amazing mission. So good luck with that mission. And I can't wait to catch up with you when you've written that book about AI and branding. Yeah, yeah, I'll let you know. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for having me on today.